All right, we are live. Love it. Hey, folks, as you're joining, wow, already 19 folks watching this. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank um, Florida, my incredibly lousy Wi-Fi connection. Every kid in every kid in Florida doing online classes right now, which explains why I look like I'm talking through, I don't know, <laughs> water. <laughs> And, and and Jody looks just fantastic. This is it's just not fair. I've, I've been through this like five times this week where our guests look incredible and I just look horrible. Uh, but I'm guessing, Jody, are you in Palo Alto right now? I am, yes. Okay, that explains it. All right, dang it. Jacksonville, Florida on this side, Palo Alto on that side. That explains why I just look absolutely <laughs> horrible. We're just going to go with that. Everybody, um, as you're... Tune in. We're going to give it a minute. Grab your coffee. Um, get a mimosa. Tomorrow's tomorrow's kind of a holiday. I think tomorrow's a bank holiday, both here in the U.S. and abroad. Although in current situations, I don't know if this is going to be a bank holiday. That's not me. Too much going on. Way too much going on. Um, I want to thank everybody who's jumping into this and watching. Um, if you like what you're seeing, smack that like button, the heart button, the whatever buttons LinkedIn gives you. Share it with your friends. If you have questions, put them in the comments. I guarantee that we will get to them and um, I will pass every single one of them on to Jody to answer because that's what I do, Jody. I apologize <laughs> for that. That's how that's how this works. You said you'd come on, so that's what's going to happen. All right, everybody, good morning. It is Thursday. I finally got the day right, the 9th of April, and this is our ninth episode of FinTech Insider, The Breakfast Show U.S., Show coming to you from the folks from 11FS, talking about interesting insights, topics, and fintech banking, and pretty much just about everything going on. I want to give a quick shout out to um, our show producers, uh, Tobias, who's sitting north of Stockholm, um, running this, and I don't know what time it is at night doing that. Hannah in London, they've done an incredible job putting the guest list together, show notes, working through LinkedIn Live and everything else. I'm Sam All, I'm the 11FS Managing Director in North America. I'm the host for this series. Again, the idea is we're all cooped up together. We're self-isolating somewhere in the world. And we, you know, it's good to actually keep the sense of community. If ever there was a time um, of community. And Jody, I'll be honest, what I've heard over and over again from folks I've talked to is they're actually reaching out more than they ever have. Um, talking to family, to loved ones, to old friends. It's amazing when you can't have human contact face-to-face. -face. Um, getting on the phone doing stuff like this just works great. So today we're very happy to be joined by Jody Scott. He's the president of Americas at Personetics. I said that right, Jody, I got Personetics out right. I have practiced that like four times today. Uh, we're, we're gonna talk about who Personetics is, why they are a great fit for this period of time that we're going through. We're talking about AI, using it for stronger customer engagement and in banking, how AI can support people's financial well-being. And again, um, Jody, you are in Palo Alto right now, right? Yes. And are you, <laughs> let's go ahead and get this question. I'm assuming you're a world citizen like myself and have lived all over the place. How long have you been in Palo Alto? Uh, I've been here about uh, 20 years, but you're right. Uh, oh, wow. I've, uh, I've been around the globe. I came here from Sydney, Australia. Wow. And before <laughs> that was, uh, was on the East Coast in the U.S. And, and you've had a heck of a career. I was looking at your, your background on, on LinkedIn before coming to Personetics. I mean, this is what I like about CEOs and presidents like yourself in, in this space. Wells, you've worked at Wells Fargo. You worked at Citizens. Um, you know, you, you've been a U.S. bank, if I remember right. You worked at McKinsey. You've got a, a – when you go back and you look at that, that litany of, of roles that you had moving into running – um, uh, you know, a, a company like Personetics. I love that experience. I'll, I'll flat out say that. You, you understand the frustrations bankers face and the challenges they face. <laughs> well, let's just say I can uh, I can empathize. So hopefully, I can I can be a little bit more effective at coming up with uh, with solutions and at least showing empathy around how to uh, how to get things done as well. Um, I'm going to get a T-shirt that says empathy. I have said that in every show. Um, if there ever was a time for our industry to show and, and, and embrace two things, one is trust and one is empathy, right? I mean, and the two go hand in hand. Um, and, and, you know, handling this may be a little bit different in, in some areas as we did in 2008. So let, let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, 
Can you kind of give us the overall, give us a summary of what Personetics is as a company? What's your mission? Where do you focus on? Sure, Sam. We are fortunate enough to be the, the global leader in data-driven personalization and customer engagement. We, we focus on proactive engagement, and we do that by analyzing financial data in real time. And then we deliver through the bank's digital platforms, insight, advice, and automated programs. And the intent is to help banks create their own personalized experience, what we call personalization IP. Okay. Personalization IP. You also have a great term. I told you this right before we started when I was looking at your website, um, self-driving someone's financial life, that, that idea. And, and the analogy you gave, right, of self-driving cars, there's actually still engagement between the driver and the vehicle. There's, there's, it's not just I click a button and I walk away. Um, can you kind of describe you know, what you mean by that, if you don't mind? Yeah, absolutely. We, we envisage a world of self-driving finance where, where banks know customers so well that they can act on their behalf to save, invest, or manage debt. And as you pointed out, it's so important to be able to have trust in the brand as well as the algorithm to be able to deliver on that kind of a vision. And Sam, there's a, there's a logical, let's call it maturity path to be able to, let's say, arrive at a self-driving finance outcome. It starts with, it starts with data, which is, helping customers understand what happened. So being able to cleanse and enrich data is the foundation. The next stage then is delivering insights, which identifies for customers what's important in my financial life right now. The next stage is then delivering advice. This is prescriptive advice that banks can deliver to customers based on their current situation and the insight that they're seeing. What action should they take? So for instance, if they have if we can see that the customer is likely to have a low balance in the future based on our pattern recognition, then let's advise the customer of what options they have to improve their current situation and avert fees. And then the last stage is this more advanced stage called automation where, again, you know the customer so well that you will save, invest, or pay down debt on their behalf that, of course, is more of a, let's call it an opt-in program where, where the customer says, use case, and you gave me a use case. So, to, so wait to <laughs> read my fuzzy mind and this great um, feed that I have. Um, and if ever there was a time we wanted to proactively engage with your customer base, you know, especially as a bank. But you look at what we're facing for our for our European um, folks that are just uh, are listening in, or if you haven't seen the news yet, the unemployment numbers came out uh, today, another 6.6 .6 million. Um, so that means in total, one out of 10 Americans have now filed for unemployment in the past three weeks. Um, that is, that is, I, I want to use the word inconceivable, but I think we expected to see numbers at that volume. So, it, it, you know, banks and their customers dealing with them, dealing with the issues they're going to run into from their financial lives. Um, there, there's a reason we have Jody on and we're talking about personetics. Because again, when you're talking about a, a market fit, right, this ability to help me, you know, make wise decisions. Um, um, to to keep up with my my financial lives when I'm in a struggle like this, man, I can't think of a, a <laughs> for purpose. That's a, that's a nice term. Um, yeah. I'll ask you a question though, Joe, because uh, one of the things that we've talked about at 11 FS, and I know this is near and dear to y'all's hearts too. Um, one of the things that we've done with technology say, since 2008 is we we got really good at the shift where we took customer engagement and kind of pushed it into the background, right? We got so in love with the UX, with digital, that if anything with technology, we've lost that human touch, right? Um, and we've, we've lost that engagement and been able to do that. So when, when you are, are working with your customers and you're coming in and you're talking about using AI for customer engagement, um, how, how do you get them over that hump? What's, what's the argument for you saying why you should use AI for customer engagement? Yeah, so... 
It's it's interesting, Sam, as customer behaviors have dramatically changed over the last number of years, heavy use around the digital activities for both servicing as well as uh, sales. But while the usage has grown, there's been some fundamental tenets of customer expectations that we believe have remained. And this is to know me, to value me, and advise me. So while these are seemingly relatively innocuous, they're very challenging tenants to execute on, particularly doing this at scale across your entire base and not just for your most profitable customers. So we believe that advice can be delivered to all customers. And with the advancements in data and analytics tools, including AI models, banks can demonstrate that they truly know customers and deliver highly personalized advice without creating bloated cost structures to be able to deliver it. And that right now, that 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 concept of providing device across the spectrum for, for your entire customer base, I mean, again, we get back to fit for purpose and fit for a time. I think that's what's so important, right? I mean, the reality is uh, those of us lucky to be on the higher end when it comes to um, our net worth, right? And um, our, our, our savings and, and how we're set up. Um, similar to 2008, a significant portion of us are going to be fine. It's those folks that are kind of in the middle and those lower tiers, they're, they're going to be facing all kinds of challenges right now. And so for the bank to be able to engage with them, for the bank to be able to, I love that, I love that, that, uh, that trinity you have right there. Know me, value me, and advise me. I wrote that down, Jody. I'm going to use that again. Um, we talk about this. So um, uh, one of our co-founders, Jason Bates, loves this terminology when he talks about what digital and, and what technology can do for a bank, this contextual, real-time um, ad- advice and engagement model. And that's what you're describing, but you're using your algorithm, the AI, to do that. And I think, obviously, we, I think the terminology of what AI is kind of gets tossed around a bit too much, right? Uh, a lot of folks like to, if you don't see a pitch deck without AI in it, or <laughs> at this point, <laughs> used to be blockchain, right? But everybody calls, you know, a lot of folks will call themselves an AI company, but y'all have proven it on a global scale, right? Um, uh, what markets are you in? When you say you're global, can you kind of expand on that? How broad? Yeah, we're, we're fortunate to be, a, to be a global enterprise. We have over 50 banks that we serve and about 65 million end customers. We have perhaps about uh, more than half of our of our business is in North America, but uh, but a good portion is also in Europe. And now we've expanded into Asia, um, into Thailand, uh, as well as Australia now. And so we we see we see we get feedback from the sixty million plus customers, and we can see some of the trends that are evolving. So some of the obvious ones are that we're seeing a significant uptick in our insights around cash flow insights. Uh, that is uh, stress indicators where customers are running short of cash. So we're seeing over a 30% uh, growth in just that. This is really valuable because if banks can identify the stress indicators early and be proactive in terms of outreach, the outcomes for the bank are much better and the customers also really appreciate when banks are on their side looking out for them as opposed to waiting for the customer to call into the call center and we know that the call centers are are overburdened today uh, so our, our yeah. global footprint allows us to one to create a, a massive kind of consumer base to to understand what we are seeing in terms of trends but then also to, to really draft learnings and improve, continue to improve our models, so that uh, that we are staying, you know, in touch with with how customers are responding and what banks need to really deliver effective personalized advice. Yeah, that's uh, and, and um, it's interesting that the comments are coming in, and folks, you see question marks on our heads. We're still live. It's just LinkedIn feed seems to be. You went as fuzzy as I did. Now suddenly I look great, by the way, everybody. That's actually what I look like. I feel so much better now. Um, uh, Jody, some good questions were to come in. Um, you, your product, do you are you selling your service directly to the banks or can you go to like an aggregator like Plaid, Galileo, for example? Yeah, of course. It's a great question. 
Um, the, uh, the strength of the platform is that we can deliver insights when we can consume transaction data. Of course, the insights and advice are all driven by consuming transaction data, customer transaction right. data. We can consume the transaction data both from the bank for their honest accounts and also with linked accounts. So oh, okay. the insights that can be that are delivered to customers are are based on the breadth of the data that we have available to us, both the honest accounts and the linked accounts. And we believe, ironically, you know, aggregation has been around for 20 years. I remember implementing it 20 years ago, but we don't believe it's ever fully met its promise. But with the advent of delivering insights on those linked accounts, we believe that is one of the real enablers towards having aggregation kind of work at scale, like it can be really effective for customers. Um, man, I I think this is the most questions I've seen in the first 15 minutes <laughs> for anything that we've done. So I'm going to try to get be, to these. That must mean I'm, I'm saying very confusing things. Yeah, no, you're doing a good job. I mean, the questions are fine. And so Brian uh, McCarty at Jack Henry in marketing asks, how do you blend humans into your products? So what happens when a consumer reaches the end of service? Why would you do that to me? Uh, screw up on me. What happens when a, a consumer reaches the edge of service, automation, et cetera? You know, where and how do you keep humans involved when the consumer just wants to talk to someone? And that and that is a very common frustration, right? Everybody just hits zero. Operator, operator, operator. So how do you blend that in? Yeah. You know, the strength of the banks is really the traditional banks at least is the the enormity of the customer data and of course the heavy investment around the human side around the branch side or assisted channel side. What we believe moving forward uh, is that banks that can combine the intelligence in the digital channel, because 80% of the interactions happen in the digital channel, mm -hmm. with, again, the empathy of the banker channel, you can create this, this synergistic approach so that you are reaching out to customers, not just with your direct digital outreach, but also having bankers intervene at the most effective time. So the majority of our customers all start with a, a, a solution that's delivered through their digital applications, either, either mobile or, or web, or even through push. But the more savvy uh, customers are now extending this solution where we can create curated insights and banker and customer events that are delivered to the banker. So now the banker can see what insights the customer has, what advice we're giving directly to the customer, and also a set of actions that the banker should take action on. Because in the situation that I just shared, let's talk about a small business now that has had yeah, income lots. disruption. Yeah. So we can see income disruption. As a small business, it's fine for me to see that that you're recognizing that, but I really want a banker to intervene and help me with what my options are at this point. And that's where we call, we, you know, so yeah. as a friendly term, we'll call this channel synergy, but it's taking the best of the digital channel and the best of the assisted channel and bringing it to bear to support the customer. All right, um, uh, another very good question. And we've talked about this repeatedly um, in the past eight episodes, obviously cybercrime is skyrocketing right now, um, and uh, as expected. So, given that COVID is creating environment that accelerates cybercrime, how would a company like Personetics help in tackling this, especially with the data that you see? Great question from yes, Amira. Sorry, Amira. Me and names. It's just not. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is a great question and in fact almost with every customer we have entertained this discussion around how we can uh, help around fraud and risk and our response thus far is there's so much opportunity right now in delivering engagement advice using that as a way to drive action and behavior um, and there are good solutions out there today for account opening fraud as well as transaction sure. fraud. Yep. So we haven't focused on that as a use case, but there are related activities. So for instance, one of the insights that we have is 
when a customer takes an overseas trip, we can recognize when they're doing that. And then as they come back, we'll also give them a, a summary of the expenses they had in that trip. So this definitely triggers within the risk and uh, specifically in the risk and fraud teams, how can you help me? But Sam, we've been very focused around customer engagement and uh, have not turned our attention to the risk and fraud as a prominent use case yet. Um, and that example you gave, you know, that was something that like in the UK, for example, Monzo would do something like that, right? You go a trip abroad, here's a good summary of that. And yep. I think one of the things that I really like about challenger banks is they have, they have um, in, in some ways pushed the large banks and, and other banks to step up their game, right? The shelf life of new products like that, like having a summary um, statement of your trip abroad in the digital age and in the modern age, it, the shelf life just keeps getting condensed. So, you know, to have a partner that is able to kind of provide those because you have, you have that overall picture, you have that access to data and you have an algorithm that you're constantly refining. Um, that's a, a great tool in a partnership. If you will, in my opinion, helps you get that 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 products out there that much quicker. Another really good question um, that that came in, man. So many are flying in, folks. But some of these we'll have to take after. So I'm I'm sorry about that because um, I don't know what it is, Jody. It, it must be that great feed going into Palo Alto. You look so good and it's so crystal <laughs> clear. Um, how do you aggregate data? I'm, I'm using stock footage. <laughs> I'm just jealous. Um, uh, Sidrahar, this this guy. Oh my God, every Day, he has asked great questions. How do you aggregate data across all user accounts to get their, to get their true financial picture? And that, that is a good question in this day and age. If data is imported from, say, Bank of America, how does Percentetics drive insights into, say, the Wells app? And what's the benefit to Bank of America in that play? That's yeah. So the so as I mentioned before, the uh, the insights and advice is all and, all and the automated solutions as well is all based on transaction data. Now, typically, there's a core set of transaction data that we like to get to drive a, a breadth of insights. And by the way, we know that every bank can develop insights. The challenge is that to do it at scale and then to orchestrate and then to optimize is, what the, is where the complexity is. So typically, we are trying to, to we are getting access to deposit data payment data, then usually subsequently we'll get scheduled and pending uh, transactions as well. As we get more data, it triggers more insights. And as previously mentioned, those insights can be delivered on the honest accounts or the linked accounts as well. So our bank customer has the benefit of showing the customer advice and potential actions based on a specific account as well as the uh, we call it the party level which is across multiple accounts yeah so so everybody that's watching this um making questions on the fly like this is not easy i don't mean for me it's really easy because i just read them and react <laughs> to them um for you know the president of a company for the ceo for the founder to be able to do this on the fly um is is, is very difficult to do I'm going to be blunt. Joe, you've done a very good job. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, but, but no, it is. It, it, you know, being able to respond to these um, it is tough and, and to be able to think through them and, and give those use cases hard. So I'm commending you. You're doing a really good job. So I'm, I'm going to be speaking one. in my ear, giving me some of the answers. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how I do every FinTech Insider, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I got somebody whispering behind me, and I'm like, oh, great. Um, uh, it's a good question. This is from Mimi Joy. Um, can the data analysis that you have be used to help the unemployed prioritize their expenses based on variables such as grace periods for payments and penalties, et cetera? Um, Mimi, I'll tell you that'll definitely be some use cases built in in the future. I don't know if y'all are able to do that now, Joey. I, I love the question, Mimi. It's so forward looking. And it I is, mean, it's it? present in terms of what's happening today, but it's also forward looking. So I'll, I'll share with you a couple of examples. All banks uh, are, are mobilizing to help customers. The challenge is that many of the communications are, are generic. And as a, as a customer, I need, I need personalized interaction. So a simple example of this is we're helping some banks that are developing solutions such as 
here are all the services that are available for you. Like here, you've got a mortgage, you've got a loan, you've got an auto loan. Here are the actions that are the resources that are available and the uh, conditions that we are enabling for for you to, uh, to to take advantage of. We are allowing banks to deliver that message and that communication to customers on a personalized basis so that the information they're trying to get to customers is being delivered and customers are actually taking action and not calling into a call center. That's very kind of real time. But the other part of your question is that going forward, we know that the, unfortunately, the financial issues will far outlive this virus. And thinking about the recovery programs for customers, both small business as well as consumers, and having banks share approaches in terms of, look, we know you went through a hardship. So as an example, we see an opportunity as, as your income starts to come back, let's say as a small business, as your income starts to come back, we think you should set up a budget in this category and manage against it and do it for the customer. Tell them which categories they need to budget. Tell them how much it needs to be because you have all of the data to be able to make that useful for the customer and make it very easy for them to do and say, do you, you know, I'm going to now track your category of spend against this budget and try and get to a better place over the next uh, over the next few months. So we think that that's one example of a recovery. Another approach is helping customers pay down high debt that they may take on. These are these are a couple of different examples around recovery programs where we think banks can be proactive and do outreach to customers that will experience financial hardship and recovery for for several months in many cases. Uh, good answer. And Joey, I'm going to blend two questions here because they're so good. Um, um, and again, I'm going to slaughter names soon. Nani, who's been on a ton of these, and Amanda Moore. Um, what's your, your take on data privacy, especially coming out of this? And what types of legislation and regulatory changes does your company advocate for based on AI and customer insights? That's a good blend, right? Data privacy balanced against what the lift that AI and those customer insights can bring. Yeah, it's a terrific question. And this is also the benefit of being a global entity because in mm -hmm. Europe, GDPR is really at, has really been at the forefront. So we have, we have crafted a solution to help uh, both banks and customers abide by GDPR regulations. So the right to be forgotten, as an example, or the right to, to disable. Uh, insights or categories of insights. Now, these are these are also going to be fairly fundamental uh, capabilities or, or or features in the U.S. And we can also already see it in California with the um, the California Privacy Act that's just been uh, that's just been released uh, earlier this year. And we expect that to to happen across the U.S. as well. So very important for the bank to be able to configure privacy and the end customer to have the right to be forgotten as well. Having said that, if, if banks deliver these kinds, of, these kinds of insights and advice as part of the experience, and it's not all about offers, even though offers can be a part of this, not all about offers. What we've seen, Sam, is that customers embrace this. And we see that because of the ratings um, and because of the way that customers engage, which is vastly different than how they engage with a typical marketing banner. So, so Jody, I'm going to let you end on a high note here, your last question, okay? Um, this is from Ali Peterson, a uh, good friend of ours over in the UK, who asked if I was wearing Spanx. Yes, Ali, I have my Spanx t-shirt on. Not really, but I just look that good. All right, here you go, Jody. Ali says, I'm a big fan of person, um, personetics. Thanks, Jody. Do you think in a post-COVID world, there'll be a surge in demand for PFM, so personal financial management, as people keep further track of their finances? That's a really good question because PFM has struggled at times within the US to take off, whereas I think in the UK and other parts of Europe, we've seen it adopted better. Yeah, it's a terrific question. And if we give a, a broader definition to, to PFM, then I'd say absolutely. Yeah. Just, uh, just very quickly, 
there's we see five kind of enduring conditions coming out of uh, of COVID. One is social distancing will create a step change impact around digital acceleration. Secondly, yeah. this idea of the personalized interactions will be fairly foundational because it'll be how how banks also drive deeper relationships. Third, delivering these insights to bankers will be really useful in terms of how they engage. Fourth one we talked about, which is ensuring that you have recovery programs in position for customers. And the last one, which I'll end with, which is that we think it's vital for banks to be accountable in helping customers create resilience. So not just offer digital products, not just offer savings products, but motivate customers to save, motivate customers to improve their credit score so they have borrowing capacity. And I think, Sam, that can be another conversation, but uh, it's, a, it's an exciting future as well as potential relationships when uh, relationship with customers when, when banks kind of have this kind of ambition to deliver more personalized guidance. And that was an excellent way to summarize <laughs> this half hour, Jody. I love that. Five actionable points. Um, I mean, that was, uh, you can tell you've done this before. Always end on actionable points, everybody. Um, all right, so we've run out of time. Jody, I really want to thank you for joining us. Um, there's been a ton of questions asked, which means there's a ton of interest. So where's the best place for folks to go and learn more about uh, Personetics? Yeah, go to our website at uh, personetics.com. And uh, of course, if they, uh, if they want to reach me directly, I'm sure you'll give them a way to do so. We will. We'll have links all over the place. Everyone else, thanks for joining us. Tomorrow's a bank holiday in the UK. It's Good Friday here in the US. So, um, And then Monday coming up to the Easter holiday. So it's a nice long break. So we're also going to take that time off. We'll be back Tuesday. We'll be joined by 11FS's own Ryan Garner. I think Ryan's in Singapore. I can't remember. He's our jobs to be done guru. Love Ryan. Um, just, uh, again, one of, I think when it comes to jobs to be done, one of the smartest people I've ever met in, in, in that process and talking about it. Everyone else, thanks for joining us. Please keep tuning in. Please keep asking the questions. For the questions we didn't get to, we will get to. We'll respond to them on LinkedIn. Jody, thanks a lot, man. It was thanks, really, man. really nice chat. Yeah, same. Bye-bye.